have have you heard any talk of calamity in the world over the last few months? If you haven't heard, you've had your head in the sand. Time to pull it out. For those of you that's on social media, if you've noticed, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of hysteria about a lot of different things that are going on in the world. And some of which I've seen have come from people who are church going people. And they're following along with the hysteria. But I think part of it is they're focusing on the wrong things. They're putting priorities in the wrong place. We addressed that last week. But people think all kinds of things whenever, you know, you see what's going on around you. So how can you, how can you stand firm? when the world around you is falling apart. And I think that's something that a lot of church-going people need to start understanding. That's why we need to prepare for what comes next. You know, Jesus told us several things that were going to happen. And are those things that we need to pay attention to? We should recognize them. And so let's talk about that this morning. If you would, please turn to uh, Matthew chapter 24. Some of you might recognize this. Uh, this chapter 24 and 25 are, are what's known uh, as the Olivet Discourse. It's um, a series of prophetic messages that Jesus gave to his disciples. And so that, you know, the just like people, people want to know what's next. What's going to happen? You ever wonder what's going to happen? Of course we do. The reason we want to know what happens is because we want to be prepared. Now, most of the time, people prepare for the wrong things. I think as, as church-going folks, we need to be prepared for the right things and looking for the right things. And that's what Jesus was pointing to here. He was trying to direct his disciples to the important part of this message. Now, there were several things that he addressed. So let's talk about these things. The first one that he addresses is the Christ delusion. And so in the Christ delusion, he says this in Matthew 24 in verse 4. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And then if you skip down to verse 24, he says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Now when we look at these, he talks about these false Christs will appear. Now have any of you ever encountered someone who claimed to be the Messiah? I have. It was in a church. Mom was there. Jeanette was there. We had a man who come in. He waited till open worship, and once everybody was done speaking, he stood up, and uh, he, he spoke in a calm fashion, and he started talking about all these generations from Adam. 
And then he said, Fear not, for your Messiah has come. I am he. I am here. Now, that disrupted some folks. That, that put some uneasiness in some folks. The pastor and I quickly got up and escorted the gentleman out of the church. Come to find out that he had done this to a lot of churches. And I think there was some, some mental instability there. Uh, come to find out that he was off his meds. But the thing is, is that there was a lot of une uneasiness within the body there of, of Christians. Uh, people that I have known for a long time, people that taught me when I was a kid, you know, people that I thought were just pillars of strength in our churches. But yet I saw some of them with very, uh, very much of an uneasiness about them. They were frightened. Now should this, should this have frightened us? Should this have frightened the church folk? No. Because Jesus warned us that this would happen. Jesus warned us that there would be people who would come and claim that they, that they were the Messiah. Do you think this guy was the first one to ever make that claim? No. In fact, there's, there's some, there's more walking around today. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube. There's a, a gentleman in Florida. That's where... Uh, that's where he has his, his compound, I guess you would say. He has deceived a great many people claiming to, the, to be the, the Messiah that he's here. People are given, turning over their property to him. People who have been in church for years are deceived. He's making millions of dollars off of these folks. But he went on national TV, a national interview, and claimed he was the the Messiah and explain why. He even used scripture. This made a lot of people uneasy, but should it have? No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't have made people uneasy. He should have been dismissed. The man should have never gotten where he was. He should, he should have never had any place of prominence among any church in the nation. But yet he did. He deceived many. We shouldn't be surprised because Jesus warned us. You know why people are surprised about things like this? You know why people become uneasy about this? Is because they have a very, very weak relationship with Jesus Christ. <coughs> they don't read their Bibles. They don't trust the real Messiah. They don't trust Christ. And so they're found uneasy. We're going to encounter more. We're going to encounter more people like this. Now Jesus warned us. And he said, he, they're going to do this. Some of them might even look like they have the appearance of doing wonderful signs and miracles. And there have been folks who look on the, at least on the top part of it, on the, the top layer, looks like they've done such things. And they fooled a great many people. And he said, and to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, people who you would never think would fall for such calamity, but yet they have. Something else that Jesus warned us of was the increase of wars and the power complex. Now if you look at verse 6, Jesus told his disciples, he said, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. How many folks have heard something about wars and rumors of war in the last several months, last couple years. Everybody has. Last night. Last night. All right, so you see what he says? You're going to hear rumors of war. There will be wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. But yet, when I look at church folk, good Christian people who, who I thought strong, they're worried. But Jesus said, don't be alarmed. It's 
should we be alarmed? Should we be observant? Of course. Should we be vigilant? Of course. Should we worry? Jesus said no. There's a reason he said no. There's a reason he said don't, don't be alarmed by it. He knew very well what is very much true today. You know, there's probably never been a five-minute span in the history of mankind after Adam and Eve bit that apple that there's been peace on earth. Bless you. Wars have been going on ever since the first sin. And they will continue. War is not something new. War is not something that uh, is just magically going to go away. Not until Christ comes back. So he tells us, don't be alarmed. And the reason he says don't be alarmed is because there's more important things to worry about, which we're going to get to in just a minute. But he told his disciples, don't be alarmed about that. And then he talks about the, uh, the, the complex, the power complex. If you notice, those who are greedy for war have a power complex. They want to oppress. They want to hold people down. They want to rule. Don't you hear people talking like that? They want absolute control over your life. In every aspect of it. And they're willing to do unimaginable things to you. Jesus said, don't be alarmed by this. It was no surprise to him. It is no surprise today. He says, he tells us, do not be alarmed. If we're rooted and grounded in the faith, then we can stand here while the world collapses around us. And we can remain vigilant and observant to these things. The next thing he warned about was this, persecution. Now, have you, have you seen any persecution? Of course. There's persecution all around. Now, I think in this country, the reason so many people complain is because we've never really experienced persecution. And a lot of reasons, that's why we have such weak faith in the Western church is because of the lack of persecution. If you go over and look at the Eastern churches, those people, they're very strong in their faith. They're willing to die for their faith. It's because they have a strong faith. And they're rooted in it. Today, Christianity is the most persecuted group on the face of this planet. Did you know that? Should it surprise us? No. No. Why? Because Jesus said it was going to happen. Jesus said that persecution is going to happen. When he was talking about war, something that typically happens from war in the power complex is that somebody wants to oppress somebody, and that comes with persecution. He said, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And then he throws in, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Now, sometimes famines, they follow war. Earthquakes, that's a, that's a natural thing there. You know, how many, have you heard about earthquakes this past week? You know, there was one, there was one in Puerto Rico. There was one in Iran. Two in Puerto Rico. All right, so that, there was three, three major earthquakes the last week. Huh? It's still there. Yeah. Yeah. But there's been a lot going on. But nation will rise against nation, and when that happens, those who are on the uh, those are who are on the wrong side of the tracks, those who are fighting for evil, and believe me, there's a great many nations out there who are fighting for evil. They have a power complex, and they choose to persecute. Jesus said, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and they will put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. 
And remember what I just said, that Christianity is the most persecuted group of people on the planet? Jesus warned us of that. When we read the Scripture and we study the Scripture, we understand and we shouldn't be alarmed when we see these things, but yet we are. We will be hated for his namesake. I know just a couple weeks ago, I was having a conversation with somebody and I was called several names, which I will not repeat. But typically when you stand for good, there will be those who are standing for evil and they stoop to that, that ground of calling you names. But it was no surprise. Because I know these are people who are not rooted in Christ. They're rooted in evil. So it was no surprise that I was called names. Horrible names. None of which are true. But people get bothered by that. You shouldn't because Jesus told us that that would happen. People would hate us. People would just as soon kill us as to look at us because of his name and it happens and it's going to get worse before it gets better Jesus warned of that too so persecution is not something that we like obviously but it is something that he warned us against he also said and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another I don't know about you but I've never seen more hate in my life than in the last few years People willing to call each other names or fight about stupid things. And they don't even know each other. How do you stoop to a level like that and you don't even know the other individual? It's because there's this spirit of hatred out there. Should it surprise us? No, it shouldn't because Jesus, again, he warned us that this was going to happen. Those who were going to stand on his word, be rooted in his faith, should not be alarmed because we know that it's going to happen. And it does every single day. And it seems like it's getting worse. There's a lot of good things about social media, but there's also a lot of bad things that come with it, and that's one of them. There's so much hatred out there and not enough love. But Jesus warned us. But here, here's the stickler. Here's the thing that Jesus warned us about and the thing that I think is the root cause of it all. It's moral decline in the church. You know, used to, the, the, the church was respected. Decades ago, the, the, the church was respected. Do you think the church is respected today? No. Why do you think it's not respected? A decline in morality. People outside the church who never go to church look at what people are doing inside the church and say, why do I need to go to church? I'm, they're doing the same thing I'm doing. You know, they're up here standing on moral high ground, but they're hypocrites. It's because they see a moral decline in the church because the people in the church act no different than the ones out there who never darken the doorway of a church. Should we be surprised? No. Jesus warned it would happen. In verse 11, he said, And many false prophets will, will arise and lead many astray. You know, this, this is one of the things why I harp to you so much about not just taking my word for anything. That's why I harp on you so much about being in Sunday school. That's why I harp so much about you being at Bible study. Is so that you can learn. So that you can learn what is right, what is wrong. You don't get all of that here in this time. You get 30 minutes. That's about it. If I go much past that, you start getting aggravated. You start looking that clock up there. As I said this week, if it was up to me, that right there would go in the trash. 
If that's all you're worried about, you need to stay at home. There's a moral decline in the church, but we shouldn't be surprised because Jesus said it would happen. He said many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. That's why people are led astray because you don't want to learn. So many of you think that you know everything. You don't need to come to Sunday school. You don't need to come to Bible study. You don't need to do those things because you know so much. I've got an idea. If you know so much, come and help me once in a while. I would welcome your help. But there's a moral decline, and that is primarily based on the people who sit in the pews because they're too lazy to do any research and study on for themselves, and they believe everything that comes from this pulpit. Believe me, I want to do the best I can. I don't want to lie to you whatsoever, but I'm human just like you. I am capable of making mistakes. I am capable of misspeaking. I am capable of leading you astray. You need to be vigilant. You need to be observant. And you're not going to know any different unless you get in your word. I could lead so many of you astray today and you would never know any different because you don't read your word. You don't study whatsoever. There's a moral decline in the church today and it's huge. And that's the biggest reason why we're seeing so much, so much of this outside the walls of the church is because it's happening right here in the church. Jesus continues in verse 12, and he says, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. You know, there, I have seen so many people in churches, in different churches, who really come across as cold-hearted people. Now, most of you come off pretty warm, and I appreciate that. Most everybody here, people I've talked to, have had visitors. They said they felt very welcome here, so I appreciate that, and so do they. But when you look across the land, you see the moral decline in churches. It is spread outside the walls. People are taking, people are taking the Bible, and they're using it to their advantage to insist on lawlessness. We have churches across this country who are not only um, doing some of these things, they're proclaiming it. They're constantly telling people to break the law. That's encouraging lawlessness. We have states that are right now that are decriminalizing theft. That's just common sense, folks. That is common sense. Right and wrong. When we don't teach right and wrong, there will be a moral decline. We got to do a better job. But the thing that we should, should be surprised of is that it happens. Jesus warned us that there would be moral decline in our, in our churches. That's what he's warning about. That's what you need to be on guard of. We need to be on guard and have a moral awareness. And so Jesus warned us of all these things, all these things that were going to happen. And he did that so that we might be prepared for what comes next. And so I ask this question, what's the remedy? Well, the remedy is, is don't worry about the unimportant. All right? And what is the unimportant? Well, most of the time, this is the unimportant. See, the disciples asked this question. They were asking the wrong question. They were asking about what the unimportant thing. And typically in the church, this is what we gripe about. We start talking about when Jesus is going to come back. It's the when and the how. So many churches will, will gripe or argue about this. Some, you know, A lot of them uh, put a lot of study and stuff in this. And when you want to study that stuff, it's okay. 
But that's the, least, that's the least important part of this. Jesus addressed something much more important because, see, that was the disciples' question. Lord, when are you going to come back? That's what they were asking. And so he addressed all of these things, all of these different things to look for. These are signs. These are things that are going to happen. And after all that, then I'm going to come back. But see, they were addressing the wrong thing. They were addressing the least important of the issue. And so Jesus told them what to look for, but don't be alarmed by it because I'm warning you now. Don't be alarmed. It's going to happen. Stay firm in your faith. Be vigilant. Be observant. It's going to happen, but don't worry about it because I'm going to tell you what the most important thing is. See, people are worried about the when and the how. The, the when part of that is Jesus, when are you going to come back? Well, Jesus said, I don't know. Jesus said, I don't know the day nor the hour. Only the Father in heaven. Not even the angels know. So when we get focused and uh, fixated on the when, when is he going to come back? How many people have you seen that is predicted, well, Jesus is going to come back on this date? Well, if you, if you do, just do a simple Google search, there's like pages, pages and pages. It's unbelievable how many people have predicted this. Obviously, they've never read this verse from Jesus himself. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So people who start to predict when Jesus is going to come back, they must skip over this verse every time. Or maybe they think they know more than Jesus does. I think that's the thing. They, know, they think they know more than Jesus does. But see, that was the question they were asking, and Jesus addressed it to them. It's not for you to know. I don't know. He said, that's, not for, that's what you don't need to be concerned about. And then we have this other issue of how. How is he going to come back? So is he going to come back before the rapture? Is there going to be a rapture? Is, is, are we going to be here for tribulation, and then he comes back, or... Has it already happened? See, people worry about that stuff. Notice Jesus didn't address that. He didn't address the when or the how. But here's what he did address. He said, For as it were the days of Noah, so will be coming of the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. All right, so the reason he addressed that is because in Noah's day, there was a warning given that something was going to happen. Over a hundred years, Noah prepared, built the ark, and he warned those around him. And they were still doing whatever they wanted to do up until Noah got in the ark, he and his family, God shut the door, and the rain began to fall. You know why Jesus didn't give, and this is just, this is an opinion, okay, so take it as an opinion. But my opinion is the reason that he doesn't give us a day and a time is because we would be no different than those people in Noah's day. Because if we knew a day and a time we would be the biggest heathens until the very second that Jesus was supposed to come back. Now, that's just my opinion. So take it as that. It's my opinion. But Jesus said it's going to look just like that. People are going to be doing whatever they want. You look in the church today, isn't the church doing whatever they want? Yeah. Yeah. Hadn't you heard in the news this past couple weeks about the United Methodist Church? You know, that's, it, it's, not, it's not new news. They've been fighting about this for decades, which was one of the reasons why we left the United Methodist Church in 2003. The pastors came back. Now, the church we were at, they did not feel this way, but they came back and said there was a narrow vote to allow the ungodliness of homosexual clergy. It was a narrow vote. In my mind, it shouldn't have been. 
a narrow vote. It shouldn't have been a vote at all. Because the word of God is clearly against it. But yet here we are, a couple decades later, and they're fighting about it, whether or not to allow homosexual clergy. You know, the Quaker church, we also went through the same thing. Thankfully, the church I was at previously and this church decided to leave and to follow along with like-minded individuals who chose to follow the word of God. But it's a moral decline where churches are just doing whatever they want to do. You see, people are doing whatever they want to do, just like in the days of Noah. Marrying, partying, having a good time. So Jesus tells them about worrying about the important. He says, worry about the important. This is what's important. This is what he addressed. He's coming. That was the important thing that Jesus addressed here. He told us, look, here's signs. Here's things going to happen. He warned us. But the main thing, the important thing, he is coming. Do you understand, folks? Young and old, anywhere in between, he is coming. This is what he warned against. In verse 42, he says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. He could come any second. He might come before we leave today. We don't know when he's coming. He said, verse 43, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Just like in the days of Noah. So Jesus didn't waste time telling them about, okay, well, this is, this is the day it's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. No, he didn't talk about that because it was unimportant. The important thing he says here is to be ready. Be ready for when we walk out the door. Be ready right now because you don't know what's going to happen. From any day, any second, he could come. That is the important thing. But so many people are like the days of Noah. They don't care. They're too lazy. They don't want to be prepared for that. They want to do whatever they want to do when they want to do it including churches. Church folk, I'm telling you, young folks, pay attention. He's coming. And you're going to stand before Christ one day. And you will give an account. That's not Pastor Kevin saying that. That's the Word of God saying that. You can deny it all you want to. But it's coming. So we have to be prepared. We need to be prepared and we need to quit playing church and start being the church. Because I promise you, not all of you here are going to go when it's time. Not all of you are going to be saved. You say, that's a bold prediction. How dare you judge me? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not the one judging you. God is. And he said, he judges based on the fruit. So if there's no fruit, then you can easily judge. Again, that's not Pastor Kevin. That's the Word of God. So I'm telling you folks, I'm pleading with you. He was talking about being prepared for what's next. Well, we're living through all this stuff that he said. So what's next? Well, Christ is coming. There's nothing that you can do to stop it. He's coming. And you will stand before him. And we will all give an account. So worry about the important thing. Be prepared. Accept Christ as your Savior. That's the only thing that is going to save you. There's not another person here that can get you anywhere. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is just that. It's a singular relationship. Your parents can't get you there. Your grandparents can't get you there. Nobody can get you there. That's between you and Jesus. So I implore you today to accept Christ as your Savior and be prepared when He comes because He is coming. So I'll leave you with this.
Are you prepared for his return? If you're still here today, if he happens to come back today and you're still here, make sure you turn the lights out. Let's stand for a closing prayer.